Hi, this is Lejeune with Lejeune Singleton LLC, fitness, health, nutrition, and wellness podcast. Season four, I am so excited for today's guest. She is a best-selling author. She is a speaker and a health advocate, Barry Roberts Ross. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting me, Lejeune. I'm excited to be here. And congratulations on your, <laughs> on your fourth year. Thank you. Thank you. So can you give a background on yourself? Because when I saw your story, 10 year um, late stage head and neck cancer, as well as your husband experiencing cancer as well, um, you know, definitely it's a blessing to have you here (laughs) and for you to share your story. So can you give a background on yourself? give you a little background. Um, In 2009, um, my husband and I were diagnosed with two different kinds of cancers, 72 hours apart. And uh, while my husband had had symptoms for months, and they were kind of honing in on what was going on with him, I went to the doctor's office with him And the doctor, he mentioned to the doctor, well, you know, my wife seems to have a swelling behind her neck, behind her ear Mm. on the right side of her neck. And I had not noticed it. Uh, I was in very good health, no uh, underlying conditions. And when my husband said that, I was like surprised. So the doctor looked at me and um, said, I want you to come back tomorrow. I went back the next day, he did what they call a fine needle biopsy. He stuck a needle into the swelling. And within 48 hours, he told me, you have cancer. (laughs) I still don't know what's going on with your husband. He needs a biopsy, which I'll be giving him in a couple of days, but everything comes back that you have cancer. When he got a CAT scan, came back the next day. He said, not only do you have cancer, but it has metastasized and it's spread and it's late stage. So I looked at this, I looked at the doctor. I was calm. I wasn't, you know, uh, you know, I was calm. And I said, so what are we going to do about it? And uh, he said, well, you know, talk to a couple of other doctors, the big doc, I was living in Phoenix at the time. He said, the doctors out here who have success or have some success in treating what you have at this stage, none of them take your insurance. I said, okay, so what are we going to do about it? And he said, uh, well, I looked in a book and I found somebody and he takes your insurance, but he can't see you for six weeks. I started getting, yeah, I started doing exactly what you're doing. I said, that is not acceptable. I'm sorry, sir. That is not acceptable. I said, you are having an insurance conversation and I want to have a Save Barry's Life conversation. And if you don't have anything to add uh, along those lines, then I'm done with you. Continue to work with my husband. I have to find somebody else. God is good. Yes, he is. My daughter worked at the major cancer hospital in Atlanta, mm-hmm. Winship Cancer, associated with um, Emory University. I left his office, I called her, I told her what she had said. She was in complete shock. She thought I had some information about my husband. And she said, just go to the nearest Staples, fax me everything you have in, that he gave you. Let me see. Let me see what I can do. Within 20 minutes, she called me back and she said, mom, this is very serious. You have got to come here. I talked to the doctors here. They want you to come like tonight. Mm -hmm. And that's when I first got the, you know, the impact of how serious it was, what I, what I, what I had. So I waited a couple of days, had to get my husband together. And then I flew um, directly to Atlanta and went to the hospital. Well, the diagnosis was I had stage four head and neck cancer. Head and neck cancer, it covers the area between your nose and your throat. Mm. And so, uh, you know, they call it that because they don't, it's not brain cancer, which is different. 
and it's not lung cancer, which it can turn into from. It can either go when it's here, it can either go up to the brain or to the lungs. So um, while we were there, my husband called and got his diagnosis. He had leukemia. So the people at, at Winship and Emory were very gracious. They said, we're going to send for your husband. Your husband can come as well. The two of you, 2,000 and something miles apart with, with this, is not going to work. So they were concerned about the family and everything. Well, all of this fell on my daughter, who had her own family, and she was pregnant. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, expecting a new baby. So here we all are. I was treated with radiation chemo because mine was very aggressive and it was moving fast. I had radiation chemo and surgery, a major surgery. My husband was treated with chemotherapy. Our treatment lasted, well, mine lasted better than a year. I was, had a feeding tube. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't eat. I was getting smaller and smaller. My husband was getting pure chemo, sometimes up to 23 hours a day for weeks at the time. Our family was amazing. You know, you need a good, if you're going through anything, I don't care what it is, whether it's cancer, heart, whatever it is, you need good caregivers and you need the family and the community. And I'm going to say that the community to be behind you. My daughter couldn't do it all. People, she had to ask people from her church to come help, help her with us. Uh, people in her neighborhood, her neighbors started coming to help. That's where the community comes in. During all of this, I learned so much during that journey. I learned a lot about myself, but I learned a lot about cancer. And that's why I wrote the book because, and I learned a lot about hospitals and doctors and the whole medical thing. And during all of this, I kept asking, what is this for? Why am I going through this? You know, what's the lesson here? Uh, fighting for my life, yes, but I also got a sense that there was something bigger going on. Um, one of the things I learned as an African-American woman, how dismissive the first doctor was, he's talking insurance. You're a doctor, <laughs> that's for the finance people. You're talking insurance when you should be talking health, wellness, diagnosis, what we're gonna do. Like I said, how this is gonna work, what all of the implications are. We never got to that point. It was all of insurance conversation. I found it difficult after I thought about it. I found it difficult to embrace that had I been of a different race, of a different gender, had I been white male sitting there, that conversation would not have been had. And if it was had, it would not have been as dismissive as it was. True. When I got to, to Winship, uh, they weren't having an insurance conversation. They were truly having a save your life. This is what it is. This is the steps we could take. This is what we can do. This is what you're going to go through. Here's your team. Work with them. Okay. It was a lot different. And I'm going to talk about the reasons why it was a lot different. Um, it was a lot different because when you go to, and I'm pushing this, I am pushing this. When you go to a university hospital, it's a heck of a lot different than if you go to your, re your, your uh, local hospital or your regional, whatever they call it. A university hospital, first of all, doesn't turn away patients. They have mm -hmm. money. They have money. <laughs> they get money. They're doing research. So they get money from the National Cancer Institute. They get money from the National Health Institute. And they also get money from other places. And so they take all insurance, they take no insurance. Mm. A lot of them, a lot of them, I'm not speaking for all of them, but a lot of them will take no insurance. Oh, wow. They don't advertise it. <laughs> and that's something, yeah, that's something that 
probably 99% of people don't know. That's correct. Until, and I'm going to tell you why it's starting to get out more as well. And this is, most of it is because of COVID. The hospitals have known for years and years that African-Americans die of everything, two to three times, everything, everything, two to three times more than the majority population or that than what was the majority population. They've been knowing that, but they've kind of like, yeah, we know it. And it's on the, on the list of 10 things that we're really working on right now is number 12. <laughs> okay, it's not a priority because nobody is talking about it. Nobody's spot, spotlighting it. Nobody's uh, raising questions about it. You know, we know that. They knew that. With COVID and it getting out with the public and it's in the newspapers and all the statistics of the African-Americans dying, you know, from COVID more so than any other race, any other population. Now they're starting to address it system-wide, right. medical, medical system-wide, uh, the hospitals are, um, but they already knew that. They already knew that when we present with whatever it is. When most of us present, most African-Americans and African-American females in particular, when we present at the hospital with, say it's cancer or say it's heart, then nine times out of 10, we've got other underlying conditions. We've got blood pressure, we've got diabetes, we've got obesity, we've got, uh, what is that, GERD or, you know, We've got other issues. We don't present with just one thing. I was fortunate, blessed that, and my husband, we were both blessed that when we came in, all we had was, you know, like minimizing, we had cancer. We had no underlying. And that is a good reason why we were both able to survive. Mm. But the other side of it is not to blame the patient. The other side of it is that we as African-Americans have to look at everything. We have to look at our financial conditions, our economic situations. We have to look at in many places we live where the food isn't healthy, where all it is is fast food stores, bodegas and little small corner stores that sell junk. You know, we live in food deserts miles after miles, especially, you know, definitely rurally, but in major metropolitan cities, for us not to have a Kroger's or a, you know, Safeway or whatever, and we have to drive far to go get fresh fruit, you know, and stuff like that. We also have to recognize as, um, and, the, and they're starting to recognize it, the whole patient education part. You know, where people show up and whatever the doctor says, okay, fine, no questions. Right, <laughs> and we're scared. Right. To, and, you know, that, well, the doctor said this and the doctor said that. Well, you know, the doctors, like I pushed that doctor. So what are you going to do? So what are you going to do? He didn't just tell me, oh, you have cancer. And I go, oh, okay. Hmm. Uh -huh. So what are we going to do? So we have to learn how to, talk to the doctors, to ask them questions, to advocate for ourselves. To, and we have to, as caregivers, have to learn, don't send somebody to the hospital by themselves or to the doctor by themselves. That's not gonna work. It is not going to work. It's not gonna work for a couple of reasons. One is that the patient usually is in such shock or distress or emotional about the diagnosis if they're being treated, they're under medication, so they're not clear, <laughs> you know, and it's good to have a person in the room with you that may hear something you didn't hear, that may be able to understand something the doctor said. In my advocacy, I work with doctors, I work with the staff, I, I work with patients and their families, but I also work with the doctors and the staff. 
okay? Because they have a, they, it's not a tendency, it's a fact. They speak their language for what they're doing, okay? We don't understand that language. We get overwhelmed by that language or we get frightened by it or we don't want to appear like we don't know, <laughs> you know? All right. And they take, and I don't say that they take advantage of it, but they don't consider that. So when I talk to them, I'm like, you need to consider, you need to consider when you're talking to patients, not to use all of your legal jargon. You, even if you have to draw pictures on the walls, okay, or on the whiteboard or whatever, to explain to somebody what is going on and let them ask questions from what they're seeing. Okay. Um, but then when I work with patients, I say, I will say, well, what did your doctor say? Well, I don't know what he said. Well, you shouldn't be sitting here telling me you don't know what he says. That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. I don't know, but I trust him. That's not good. You, you need to take the responsibility as much as you can to understand what your diagnosis is, because it's not only your diagnosis for what you're going through, it's also your diagnosis for surviving and going forward, okay? So if your diagnosis says, I have cancer, um, and they're going to give you chemo or so much radiation or whatever, first of all, you need to know what kind of chemo. And let me back up a little bit. I did get a little bit ahead. In our community, somebody says you have cancer or there's cancer. Everybody thinks it's all the same. It's like, it's like one cancer. There right. are 185 different kinds right. of cancer. Wow. So when I got treated, my chemo was nowhere near the chemo. None of nothing, nothing in it was the same as when my husband got treated for leukemia. Mm -hmm. When I got treated, uh, friends of mine had breast cancer. What they were, there was like at least 10 or 12 different kinds of breast cancer. And each one is treated with a different chemo. <laughs> so we think cancer is one big thing with one chemo and it's not, it's very complicated. It's very layered. And when, you, when a person gets their diagnosis, they need to know that, what the chemo is how many radiations, what's expected to happen from that, if they need surgery afterwards, what kind of surgeries. So you don't leave all of that to the doctor. You don't. I, I, I don't think you lead all of that to the doctor. You need, as a patient, either you get to understand it or get somebody in your circle, your family, your village, whatever you call it, to get a better understanding. Because when you survive, then you've got to know how to stay healthy, what not to do going forward, what to add to your diet, what to take out of your diet, you know, how much, extra, those kinds of things. But again, we tend to hear cancer and a lot of us tend to hear cancer again and think it's a death sentence. Right. You know, oh, I'm just going to give up. I'm not going to do nothing. I'm going to die anyway. You know, I've heard it all. And actually, in, in the cancer world, more people are surviving, more people are surviving longer. And some people are even thriving, okay, after cancer. But again, it's a mindset. It's a, it's, it's a mindset that says, I can survive it. And most of the people that are surviving aren't us. They don't look like you and I, right. they don't, you know. Um, part, the, another part of my advocacy is I, I what do I wanna say? If you looked at me, I would, they would say you specialize in cancer, right? Because you know a lot about it, you've been through it, you've got the experience or whatever. But a couple of years ago, I took my advocacy outside of just cancer and said, okay, I need to look at all chronic diseases that affect African-Americans. I need to widen my scope uh, 
to as to edu patient education and as to my advocacy. So now I get calls from people with all kinds of stuff saying, well, what about this? Well, what about heart? Well, what about uh, gastro, you know, your stomach? What about other things? And what I'm learning is, or what I've learned is the attitude is the same when it comes to us. It's not the disease, it's societal or institutional about us, about us. And so in the last year and a half with the COVID, uh, with the numbers coming out and the doctors being challenged and the medical system being challenged, like how do you justify out of 600,000 people that have died from this and 400,000 of them are African-American or people of color? You know, that, that, and, and we're 13% of the population. I'm a numbers person. I don't like to talk a lot of numbers when I'm talking to people, but that's significant. That's significant. And I definitely agree um, because I think another thing with the African-American community, we don't go to the doctor. We wait till it's severe before we go and we're in the late stages mm -hmm. and it's too late um, because it is an issue in our minds where we're talking about insurance. Mm -hmm. We have it coming out of our checks bi-weekly, mm -hmm. but we don't want to pay that copay of $20 mm -hmm. to $50. Mm -hmm. But at the back end, you're paying hundreds to thousands of dollars to treat cancer or whatever else that you end up getting, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, whatever the case is. Yes. And the questions aren't asked because like you said, you know, they're saying the doctor in a white coat, more educated. And it's that, well, I don't want to ask, I don't know, I don't want to sound stupid. Mm -hmm. So what do you tell individuals that come to you? What type of questions should they ask doctors? Okay. So first of all, my motto is your life, your fight. Okay. Right. It's right. a big motto. And I, I mean, when I came up, when I came up with that, I, it had so many layers and so many implications. So when you talk to the doctor, there are a couple of things you should be seeking, okay? Once you get a diagnosis, you know, while they're trying to come up with the diagnosis, keep asking them questions. What are you looking for? You know, like when you go in, they ask you, they give you two pages of questions, right? What do you have? What did your mother have, et cetera, et cetera. You need to ask them, so what are you looking for? So how can I, and ask them, how can I help you? <laughs> you know, instead of you, let us be a team. Let us all be a team, me, you, the caregiver, and whoever else. Doctors are not, in most hospitals, supposed to discuss money with you at all. That's against HIPAA. Okay, so if they, and that was this guy, he was in his private office. He should not have been discussing money and insurance with me. That's not what you're there for. You're there to come up with health answers, answers to those kinds of problems. Um, the other thing you can ask the doctor is one of the things I kept asking him was I was like, how do I get that? How did I get this? When he told me the people that had what I had, I shouldn't have even technically or rationally, I shouldn't have been sitting there. What I had was a disease that white men over 40 smokes, drinks, does recreational drugs. Those are the people that have mostly have the head and neck cancer that I had. I, I fit in none of those categories, none of them. So my whole thing was, okay, so how, how did I get this? Sometimes they can answer it, sometimes they can't, but you do need, I, I encourage people to ask that, okay? If it's hard, you know, they say that something like 70 to 80% of diseases we think a lot of African, well, my auntie had it, uncle had it, this. <laughs> They're finding out that it's not genetic. 
Mm -hmm. We think a lot of them are genetic. It's the other way around. 75 to 80% of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I agree. Less than 20% are hereditary. And some of them, stuff happens. Right. You know, that was my case. Stuff just happened. I just got it, you know, the, but we, we, again, as African-Americans, our culture, our community, well, auntie had it, daddy's brother, <laughs> you know, we come up with this conversation. Um, we, again, need to challenge them. Okay. And they're going to tell you, and we need to be able also to accept the answers. Right. Yeah. It's, your, it's what you're eating, sis. You know, it's mm -hmm. what you're smoking. It's or what drinking, you're drinking. Right. Or not exercising. Right. Or, you know, we need to accept those answers because we can only get better from that than, than the mythology of, you know, the somebody else in the family had it. And they might have, but guess why they had it? Same lifestyle choices. <laughs> so... You know, it's a conversation. I think the other thing you need to challenge and ask the hospitals, do you have patient advocates? Do you have some a patient advocate? Been hearing about it. It's it, it was starting to get some traction in the press and stuff, but then COVID came. And so you don't hear about you don't hear about anything with the hospitals except for COVID nowadays. But um, a lot of hospitals are starting patient advocacy groups. And so that's something you need to ask about. And I think that's important because, you know, like you said, a lot of people, they go, the doctor says certain things and they take the doctor's word. They don't, you know, challenge it or anything or ask questions. So I think that's important to have someone there who's fully educated on and knows how to ask questions to help putting in the terms that a patient who may not understand can, you know, absorb. Exactly. The other thing that I think is important for people to know, and I, and I can't say this enough, when under Obamacare and especially under Obamacare or since Obamacare, because now all insurance do it, if you get a diagnosis, you have a right to a second opinion and you should take advantage of it. You should, if a doctor tells you it's this, you have a right to go and say and tell that doctor or not tell that doctor, but you have a right to say, I want a second opinion. That again is something that we as African-Americans, if, even if we don't know about it, we don't do it. First doctor in a white coat, like as you suggested, Lejeune. Uh, and he says, it's this, is this, is this. And you go, okay, no, don't do that. I've worked with several women who um, have had breast cancer and they went to the doctor and, you know, you go see a surgeon, he's going to give you surgery, you know, uh, and you got to have a full double mastectomy, you know, next week. Or, you know, you got this, you got to have a full hysterectomy. And I have suggested in many, I have suggested in all cases, go for a second opinion. And in several of the cases, they had a lumpectomy. They had a partial, you know, a partial hysterectomy or in some cases, no hysterectomy. And so it is, again, so important that you advocate for yourself. They're not there to do that. The doctor's not there to advocate for you. He's a scientist. He's a doctor. He's there to do whatever he does. Another word, another thing to be careful about is it's called standard of care at the hospital. So if you go to the hospital and say what I had, the standard of care is uh, chemotherapy, right? That's the standard of care. That's the least amount they're going to do for you. Mm. No, you want you don't want this unless it's something very minimal. You don't want the standard of care. How does it look if the standard of care, say for instance, um, 
if you cut, if, say for instance, you get, you get, you cut your finger or something like that. The standard of care might be two stitches. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if your finger is practically falling off, you might need major surgery and some reconstruction and some, and some rehabilitation on how to use it, those kinds of things. But again, the medical industry institutions tend to give us the standard of care, which also contributes to the, the numbers, the disproportionate numbers of us that don't make it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's like that, Lejeune. <laughs> <laughs> so what should someone look for for signs such as what you had with the head and neck cancer what are some of the things that they should look at or look for right I think the first when you start noticing changes in your health the, the, the cancer is sneaky cancer is a little different than um some of the other like your heart or some of the other more chronic diseases Different cancers present different ways. Uh, many cancers, not all of them, but many of them, you have swellings in your lymph nodes and your right. lymph nodes are all over your body. Right. So as soon as you see that, uh, you might want to go to the doctor and, you know, everybody says this. I've had this over and over again. Well, I thought it was an infection. And the doctors first, you know, they're not going to jump on cancer first. They're going to jump on, oh, it's probably an infection. Here's a Z pack. Take it for six days or whatever it is. If it's not better, come back, come back. That's what they were doing with my husband. Okay. But your lymph nodes swelling up under your arms, under your, uh, in the back of your uh, neck, uh, and other places in your groin, because uh, lymph nodes are everywhere. Right. Uh, but that you, you need to get that looked at. Mm -hmm. um, changes in your appetite, major changes in your appetite. Those are some of that's one of the symptoms. Um, um, what do I want to say? Major changes like, uh, oh gosh, that's another area where our numbers are ridiculous. Colon cancer, mm -hmm. <sighs> crazy for African Americans. The numbers are mm, just very, very disparate. Uh, but changes in your bowels. Uh, and, and you know what's regular for you. And then you know if something's wrong. Right. Uh, so your appetite, your lymph nodes, your bowels, um, changes in your sleeping. That's another thing. Changes in your sleeping patterns. Uh, I remember... When I first was diagnosed, I was menopausal. So mm. I thought all the night sweats and all of that, even though I had no other symptoms, but I'm thinking, oh, okay, I'm starting to be menopausal. Maybe that's why I'm sweating at night or whatever. And it was really tied to what was going on in my lymph nodes that, you know, was, was, throwing, was throwing me off. So, I mean, you know, it's different cancers, of course, the lumps, you know, you check your breasts for, you know, lumps and those kinds of things, but just be, you know, your, your, your life, your fight, know your body, even before you get to that, <laughs> even before you get to thinking of diseases, just know your body. Definitely agree. So I want to talk about your book, Stronger With Two. Yes. Love the title. <laughs> and you. can you talk about, you know, what was your decision in writing the book? Yeah. Well, in writing Stronger With Two, when it, 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 it came from, it, well, let me tell you where it started. It started when I would tell people or my husband would tell people about us being diagnosed 72 hours apart with two, you know, late stage cancers. And people say, oh, my God, you need to write a book. <laughs> oh, you need to tell that story. But, you know, and I was hesitant at first because it's very personal. My book is very personal. And every the people that read it say, we felt like we were in the room with you. We felt like, you know, we were, you know, fly on the wall because you took us through everything, good and bad and indifferent. Um, 
But the more I started writing about it, and it was very healing for me to write about the struggle, uh, because a couple of times I had major setbacks, and actually one of the setbacks almost killed me more so than the cancer. I had gotten, um, what do they call it in the hospital, uh, a staph infection. Oh, wow. And, yeah, I got septic, sepsis. And, and my body started to shut down. And again, that was a whole nother thing about, you know, you go to the hospital, I went to the emergency room and they kept saying, you don't have cancer. And you, you, you know, you're in remission. And I kept saying, I'm not here about the cancer. Something else is going on because I knew my body. Right, right. And they were still running tests for cancer and they got ready to send me home. And I told them, I said, I'm not going home. You don't you know there is something wrong. You're telling me there's nothing wrong, but I know there's something wrong with me. And I fought a whole day. I would not leave that hospital. And then they admitted me. And then that night, all of the stuff from the sepsis start coming up. And I could have died from that. And I ended up being in the hospital three weeks oh, and, wow. they were going to, and they were going to send me home. But, you know, it was a major infection everywhere. Uh, out my whole body was the kidneys. Everything was starting to shut down. So uh, once that happened and I started getting better, I wanted to use my story, my and my husband's story about what it takes to fight the cancer, but also I wanted to that to talk about, to use that to talk about the advocacy and, this, and the importance of it and to give examples and, you know, not to just talk about it, but to have real live examples in the book. And that actually happened to one of my friends one time. She went to the emergency room and they kept telling her that they couldn't find anything. She went for her bag and she's like, well, I'm not leaving because I know there's something wrong with me. They called the police on her. I know. <laughs> I know. I, I do know that they have done that. But what I did was because I was already a patient there. And, and again, mm, that's a good example. When I was going to the emergency room, I was in the, I was in the ambulance and they were like, we're going to take you down the street and around the corner to this hospital. So you still got to advocate. I said, oh, no. I said, I am a cancer patient up in Emory and I know it's 35 miles from my house to there, but we're going there. And the guy was like, well, no, our rules say we take you to the nearest hospital. I said, OK, well, then let me out. I'll get my husband or somebody, somebody else to drive me an Uber. I don't care, but I'm not going to this hospital. Right. Okay. I'm going to the hospital where they know me or they have my record. I get there and, and learn that emergency rooms are not for cancer patients. Not really. Cause they don't have the oncologists, the kinds of doctors, the special doctors that you need. And so they're going to run standard of care, standard of care test you know, and so they might not find anything if your case is not within that box. And so when they told me they were going to send me home, the emergency room was going to send me home. I said, oh, no, you are not. I have three doctors here. I have a team of cancer doctors. I know it's five o'clock in the morning, but they'll be here soon. And we're going to wait till they come and let them look at this. Mm. Yeah. See, I was, ab I was sick. Oh my God. I remember that night. I was, that day I was, that whole time I was sick and still fighting for my life, my fight, my life. And I found my voice. You know, I was, when, oh my, I remember being furious when they told me they were going to send me home. And I said, no, I'm not going. And I knew that they could call the police, but that's why I said, Send me my doctors. They've been working with me for the last year with this cancer. Okay. And if they're not, if one of them's not here, all three of them ain't out today. <laughs> so right. just send me one of them. And when he came, he heard me. He knew who I was. He knew my case. And he said, I will admit you to the hospital tonight, to overnight. If nothing comes up, 
promise me you'll go home tomorrow. And I said, <laughs> please admit me to the hospital tonight and let's come up with, again, what is wrong with me? Because I know there's something wrong with me, okay? Please admit me to the hospital and I'm not promising you I'm going to go home tomorrow, <laughs> but I will consider it tomorrow. Four hours later, all this stuff came up and had I gone home, I would not be here talking. That's for certain. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, that is, yeah, that's scary, but I'm glad that, you know, you stood your ground with that. Yeah. Because most people don't. And then that is the case. They end up going home and they pass away. Exactly. I do know that. Yeah. I know that. But we have to find our voice. People like myself and there's others that are out here fighting every day, uh, you know, in these big organizations. I also come up to... Uh, Maryland, because I'm on um, a task force at the National Cancer Institute, the National yeah. Insti Health Institute. Yeah, um, because I didn't want to just stay in Atlanta. I needed a national platform. I needed to, a national, a uh, big national institution, because I learned so much, even, even more. Like one of the things, and you know, I don't know how much time we have, but one of the things future, and you know, I'm looking forward. We should start looking forward. We're going to get past. We're we're going to get past the COVID. We're going to have to learn how to live with it. It is not going away. Right. Right. It's really not. Okay. Yeah. That's just a fact. It's yeah. not. You know. You know. It's like the flu, the cold, or whatever. It will keep evolving, and we'll have to keep vaccinating or vaccinating or not, whatever you decide. But all medicine, and I want everybody to hear this, all medicine going forward, and this is why it is so important that they address the disparities now. All medicine going forward is going to be customized. So what the, the standard of care eventually will go away. But all medicine, like if you and I had the same cancer, Standard of care would say you and I both get X number doses of chemo, whatever. Because of the advances in science, they will really be able to say Lejeune needs specifically this, this much for this long. They've already got models for, the, for people that aren't us. Right. Because they've enrolled in clinical trials. All other medicine has been based on them and their DNA and their genetics and their lifestyles or whatever. We are behind the eight ball on that. So we will still continue to get the standard of care unless we advocate for us, unless we get in clinical trials. And I know the whole discussion, I have spoke on the whole discussion about African Americans being used as guinea pigs. I've spoke on the syphilis. I've spoke on the mustard gas in World War I, where they were using, you know, where they've used us as guinea pigs. Right. But going forward, and they've made some changes, eth ethical changes. They have done that within the medical institutes. Um, but going forward, Unless we're in these trials or unless we're in these, what do I want to say, um, circumstances where they can customize it for us, it won't be. It won't be. And then we'll get the standard of care and the numbers won't change. I also work with, um, I'm also on a couple of, of uh, things with Morehouse. Morehouse mm -hmm. University, Morehouse Medical down here, who is, who they are doing amazing things. I understand um, FIS Medical, FIS, FIS Medical School, in terms of people of color, they're doing a lot of things to address these things that I'm talking about going forward. Your mm -hmm. whole medical, in, a, in, a, in another four or five years, and it's already started, um, 
your cell phone will be your your way you won't even have to go to the hospital to get x-rays you're going to be able to, or to get certain tests it's going to be right on your cell phone you're just going to hold your cell phone scan your body you'll be talking to the doctor telemedicine they've already started that and your cell phone will be sending the information to them and they will be able to at least give you a basic diagnosis before you go to the hospital back and forth back and forth so the whole thing is changing and we just have got to be part of that change. We've got to get our voices at the table to be heard. And as you, you know, mentioned the studies, like the situation at John Hopkins, um, what was her name? Um, I forgot her name, Lackins. Oh, Henrietta Lack. Yes. Yeah, I speak on that and, too. And, um, you know, definitely our whole fear around that of being taken in and pieces of us being taken out. Right. Um, you know, we, we still need to have that medical check. We still need to go in and the disparity is definitely coming now with COVID where people who aren't vaccinated, some, especially in Florida, they're not accepting patients who are not vaccinated. That's correct. So it's like, okay, so, you know, where, where, where is the ethics, the, of the medical ethics that you take, you took to serve all communities. And we all know, even before COVID, it was a situation, they weren't serving all communities. Exactly. Because if you didn't have insurance, they would ship you to the local county hospital. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, hospitals, I, again, the, the racism, I'm just going to use that word, is institutionalized everywhere. It's no different the hospitals, the schools, where you work. It, it is, this is America, it is what it is, okay? Um, Hospitals, like with the COVID, they, they, you know, it's interesting. They're making it sound like uh, in Florida, unless you've been vaccinated, which the governor says you don't need to be vaccinated. Again, how does public health become political? Public health is public health. Right. Okay? Right. Now, all of a sudden, it's, it, it's political, you know, because this one said this, this governor said don't and this one said do. But hospitals have been in the triage business long before COVID. And picking certain patients over other certain patients is not new. So picking the vaccinated over the unvaccinated to do whatever you do, triage is triage, okay? So if you say one of the reasons they would say, I'm gonna, we're gonna take the vaccinated people is they have a better chance of survival. It costs less. I mean, it's a cost, it's still a business. So they'll say, well, we'll take the vaccinated people because we can help them. You know, uh, the unvaccinated, not so much. Then our numbers, again, get skewed because they're more likely to not survive this. So the, the whole triage thing that's been going on and, and, and all of it wasn't just based on survivability, the triage, again, a lot of it was based on race and economics. Definitely, definitely agree. Yeah. So what else is coming up for you? Because um, you have definitely a lot from being a speaker, you know, um, advocacy. So what's next for you? Well, I, you know what, it's interesting you ask because I ask you, I'm really thinking about starting my own podcast that, that, that this is, and I bring in speakers and stuff. I'm definitely, um, can I hold up my book? You can please and tell well, us back to find it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Stronger With Two and um, it's on Amazon as a paperback and Kindle, but it's also available at Barnes and Nobles, Walmart, you know, all of those things. And uh, 
like I said, I think it's a good book. It's gotten great reviews. <laughs> it's selling pretty good for, for, since I can't really get out on the road the right. way I want to because of COVID. Um, but what I really want to do is, um, like I said, I want to start more, more like a support group, an online support group pushing, supporting people who either want to be advocates who and matching advocates with people. So if I get the advocates and I get people that say, okay, I have this and I need someone that's familiar with, you know, this disease or that disease. And, and that's what I'm looking to do, really moving forward. Okay. And do you work, I know you say you come to Maryland area, but if this patient that need services, do you assist them in other states? I can, uh, I have, um, not so, I've, I've assisted people down here in Atlanta, South Carolina, I mean, in Georgia, South Carolina, mostly in the South. Um, but one of the things I'm opening myself up to and some of the other patient advocates I work with is to do that, is to build a network nationwide for us. And, and I'm going to be real, real specific. Uh, when I'm at uh, Winship and when I'm at Emory, I work with all kinds of patients. But I want to be real clear, real specific and working specifically with people in my community. Mm. And, and, and particularly Black women. I'm not excluding Black men because I do work with them. But we are the nurturers. Okay. So, you know, if my husband said, you know, I'm not going to the doctor, we got, you know, we're put, go to the doctor, push the doc, you know, push the men or whatever. And our sons and our kids, because now there's now we're seeing, you know, it's the same thing um, with the kids that are getting COVID. It's us. Yeah. It's, you know, the pediatric hospitals, you're talking about turning away grown people, the pediatric hospitals down here start to turn away kids. That's, that's no good. That's no good. <laughs> so, yes, I do. You know, under the right circumstances, I do visit and work with people in other places. But yes, but I want that to, I guess I'm trying to, I've already done my LLC, <laughs> Strawberry nice. LLC, and now I'm starting to really put it together. I think that is something that is definitely needed. <laughs> in the African-American community. Um, you know, I've talked to my mom about, please ask questions when you go. Please don't just take prescriptions. Ask them why they're giving you prescriptions. Um, I think it's definitely needed. You know, I've offered her, hey, call me. I'll be on the phone with you. I'll, you know, yes. but um, it is needed because it is that fear of, I don't want to sound stupid. Yeah. Um, this person is more educated, have longer experience, and I just, you know, need to find out. And it's that fear of, for me, just getting prescription after prescription after prescription because the side effects, you go after taking something, you're saying, oh, it's making me nauseous. It's right. the medicine. What happens? You get another medication. Oh, now I can't sleep. Now I'm having delusions. Now I'm constipated. Now I'm having dizziness. Yeah. It's just a trickle. And you're just taking all this medicine for all this stuff. And it's like, but you, you're you never asking questions. Is this a side effect of this medicine? That, the side effects are definitely an issue. But to me, along with that, are people who have been on the same medication for 20 years yes, yes. and never got off of it and never, you know, and it's not healing you. <laughs> You're just right. taking, you know, these pills. And like you said, and then this pill leads to that pill. And after you've taken this one so long, now you got to take something to help your liver because that pill has damaged your liver or your kidneys or whatever. That is not health, okay? <laughs> it's not no, health. No. It's not health. And the fact that doctors, the fact that patients don't ask, you know, when am I coming off of this, okay? Uh, how long, I, or when they give it to you, how long I gotta be on this? 
you yeah. know, and there are people, oh my gosh, I, one of my friends, I visited her, her mother was taking almost 30 pills a day. And I'm like, for what? For what? That's insane. That's toxic. Yeah. That's uh, toxic. You can't get well doing that. No. A lot of us have forgotten what healthy health looks like. You know, that might be a whole nother conversation for me and you another <laughs> yes, time. Yes, definitely. But we, we don't know what healthy looks like. You know, when I got through with cancer, I changed my diet. I changed my exercise. I changed my mind. Mm. And that's powerful. And that's where it starts, your mind. Your mind. Okay. And we come out of these. I remember coming through cancer and both my husband and I, we were literally suffering from PTSD. I mean, I had to get counseling. Because it was that traumatic, you know? Oh, I lost my thing. Yeah. I had, to get, I had to get some emotional counseling just to say what I had just been through and how it had affected me. And, and like you said, how, what do they call it? Um, survivor's guilt. You know, certain things that you see, you see other people you might start the journey with and you see them all the time at the hospital and all of a sudden you're gone. You know, that was, that was traumatic. Some of that was very traumatic. So, but it starts with your mind. I want to thank you so much for coming on because I learned a lot myself that I didn't know in regards to cancer um in regards to university hospitals and i think that's powerful for people to know because there are so many questions you go to the hospital and you you know you're fighting you really don't want to go especially now with covid because right. that fear of they're going to keep me and i'm gonna end up in the icu right. so Thank you so much. How can someone reach out to you for, you know, any type of speaking engagement, advocacy? My um, email, I wish I had, I wish we could put it up. Uh, my email is berr1952 at gmail. Okay. I have a website, barryrobertsross.com. <laughs> uh, you can reach me there. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook is Barry Roberts, but I'm also on Facebook is Stronger With Two. I have a, a page of Stronger With Two on Facebook. So, okay. And I will definitely add that so people can reach out to you because you're needed. <laughs> Thank you. You are definitely, definitely needed. And I thank you for being on um, because what you said was definitely powerful and hopefully it will change several people's lives that, you know, have that fear of asking questions or that fear of going to the doctor. So thank you. Thank try to, like I said, try to go to the best. You deserve the best care there is for whatever you have. And I know that the best care and, you know, everybody doesn't live near one. They're far and few between. But if you can get to one, and if your insurance requires you to get a referral to go there, you know, some places, you know, their insurance says you go to your local doctor and he has to refer you to. But a lot of times, and what I've, what I've seen is people go to their local hospital, their local doctor, and then he, they get to a point where they can't treat you. And then they send you to the university hospital. Well, that's kind of late. Right. You know, you've, you've wasted precious time in that case. So if you go to him, ask for the second opinion, ask for the referral, and get, your, get yourself to the best place where you have a better possibility of surviving and thriving. I definitely agree. Thank you again. Um, Thank you. Please check out her book, Stronger With Two. And if you 
definitely need her for speaking engagement, health advocacy, and please reach out to her. Thank you again, Barry, so, so much for Thank being you. part of this. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> no problem. Okay. All right. Next All right. time. Thank you. With Jim Singleton. See you guys next time.